Uh, next for the keynote is Adrian Ivakiv, Professor of Environmental Thought and Culture at the University of Vermont, where he co-leads Eco Culture Lab, a collaboratory for ecology, arts, and the future. His books include Shadowing the Anthropocene, Eco-Realism for Turbulent Times in 2018, Ecologies of the Moving I Image, Cinema, Affect, Nature in 2013, Claiming Sacred Ground, Pilgrims and Politics at Glastonbury and Sedona, 2001. He co-edits Media and Environment Journal, and in 2022-23, Fulbright Scholar and Cinepoetics Fellow at Free University Berlin. He begins his tenure as the J.S. Woodsworth Chair of the Humanities at SFU in January 2024. Wonderful to meet you just now. Please join me in welcoming Adrian. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you um, to Samir and everyone involved in organizing this, and um, also to the land and its uh, stewards, custodians, the traditional ones who've been named earlier. Um, I'm looking forward to being here as of next July. Uh, but right now I'm in Vermont, so I'm bringing a little bit of fall to a colder place. Uh, we're having a kind of extended summer, and uh, the changing climate is going to be a bit of a running theme here. So this will be a meditation on seeing ourselves and seeing ourselves seeing ourselves in times of crisis, anxiety, war, and suffering. And if you're wondering who I mean by ourselves, I mean whoever is willing to come along for the journey. You're all welcome. Um, I've changed my subtitle from what's in the program uh, to give this a slightly different emphasis, less on theorists, one or two of whom I'll barely refer to, and more on what I consider the current state of urgency. This will be in two parts. First part is realism of the intellect, Second is optimism of the will. And it's a little bit hastily thrown together, so I apologize if it feels a little circuitous and half-baked at times. By intellect, I really mean something more like what in Chinese is called xin, or heart-mind. And there are many reasons for um, looking at the world through a lens that includes both of those together. And there are also many reasons to be pessimistic in the world. Some are rooted in a gaze that sees the world through a glass darkly. They are phantasmic, sometimes phantasmagoric. Others are clear-eyed enough, though caught up in each episode rather than in the greater movement of time and things. The question I want to ask is what kind of pessimism or what kind of affective sensibility more generally can help us seemingly ill-fated humans get through the bottleneck of looming crises that we face, political, ecological, climatological, and other kinds. Whether we understand these crises the same or not and whether we understand these crises correctly or not. We may disagree on the details, but precarity and vulnerability are conditions we can be sure to face, if not today, then tomorrow. In a 2018 article urging an optimism of the intellect, cultural scholar Lawrence Grossberg argues that contemporary politics are shaped by an affective landscape of redemptive nihilism, characterized by an increasing narcissism, a multiplication, augmentation, and dispersion of anxiety, a dissociation of affect from systems of meaning, and a, um, a privileging of, re resulting in a privileging of gut feelings, and a hyperinflation of affective judgments, and a presentism that leaves no place either for notions of tradition and the past or for the future a future most commonly sensed as apocalyptic. It's this last part in particular, the lack of a future and of a past, or in fact of multiple futures and multiple pasts, that I want to try to get at in, in my comments, which I'll do with the help of Walter Benjamin, among, among others. 
Um, but first, in a 2017 book, political theorist William Connolly diagnoses two kinds of nihilism, a passive and an aggressive one, with both being rooted in the affective perception of loss, coupled with an existential resentment at the loss. Both look backward, both of these nihilisms look backward and imagine some sort of fullness, totality, or wholeness in the past, a past that is singular and that is slipping further away from us in the present. Connolly sees this resentment as underlying the resurgence of fascistic impulses we see around the world today. And yet, loss is all around us. The loss of millions to the Holocaust fueling the fear that defends itself in Israel. The loss of land in the Nakba displacing hundreds of thousands and fueling the resentment against the set settler occupation of Palestine. The loss of great Russian imperial pride fueling the resentment of those Ukrainians, as it happens, who reject and desert the imperial project. The loss of the American dream in whatever phant phantasmagoric variant to the realities of precarity, the loss of imperial greatness, of white America, of old time religion, of family and gender norms, and so on. I'm not equating these, merely noting that for someone somewhere they represent loss. Encompassing all of these but invisible to most is the loss of the conditions of relative climatic comfort within which civilizations have flourished here and there for centuries at a time in immunological bubbles of smaller and larger size for close to 12,000 years. The loss of Holocene phenology. How do we face these losses with dignity and with our humanity intact. Connolly calls for a presumptive generosity of spirit that is open to the uncertainties of a complex, yet creative, larger than merely human world. He calls it an entangled humanism, one that would build an eco-egalitarian alliance among diverse strands of thought and practice. And that thread of more than human entanglement is also one that I intend to build on a little later in this talk. Like Connolly, I want to argue that while optimism of the intellect might not be available to us, what is available is a realism that may look like pessimism because it acknowledges that the worst possibilities seem already here but that at its heart remains open to the possibility of radical transformation. I call it an open-hearted realism in that it accepts and acknowledges the pain of the world. It's open also in seeking the contours of what some would call redemption, what Walter Benjamin called the messianic in every situation it encounters. And it's open-hearted in its insistence that the heart and the mind are not at odds with each other, but as the ancient Chinese philosopher Mengzi proposed in the concept of Xin, commonly translated as heart-mind, that they co-occur in a single sensibility. To get at this open-hearted realism, I'll look to an image made famous by Walter Benjamin, and then bring in some insights of a few other thinkers. In the eighth of his theses on the philosophy of history, or on the concept of history, Benjamin observed that the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. Today, a full 83 years after he wrote that, in the midst of the horrors of fascism in its most militarized form, Today, it's not just messianic Marxists like Benjamin who would say this about the unexceptional circumstances of our current state of emergency. If the rising prospect of climate change induced catastrophe, coupled with grotesque global inequalities, the rise of national fascisms around the world, the multi-generational hatreds fueling wars, and the possibility of a nuclear conflict triggering larger conflagrations make ours seem a novel state of emergency. Indigenous, 
colonized and formerly enslaved peoples remind us that some have lived through a state of emergency lasting many generations. Some have experienced 500 years of emergency, such that there is little new here today, just the logical extension of what's already happened. We are, for these people, already after the end of the world. As Kyle White puts it, indigenous people already inhabit what our ancestors would have understood as a dystopian future. This makes the fact of their continued existence a kind of musical tonic key against which any melodies play dissonantly if they don't recognize that background. Far from slowing down, the slow violence of colonialism appears to be speeding up such that Benjamin's very next thesis appears all too resonant. Describing Paul Clay's 1920 oil transfer drawing called Angelus Novus, Benjamin wrote, this is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. In another retranslated version, he writes, the angel would very much like to bend down over this disaster to dress the wounds and resuscitate the dead. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Benjamin had bought Clay's drawing in 1921, thought about it, wrote about it, and discussed it with others, including two interlocutors who played important roles in safeguarding and preserving the image, Jewish scholar of religion and mystic Gershom Scholem and Frankfurt School theorist Theodore Adorno. And between them, sorry? Oh, <laughs> it's a, maybe it's a, a fake picture, I don't know, I found it online. And between them, between Sholem's and Benjamin's Messianic Judaism, and between Adorno's and Benjamin's neo-Marxist historicism, there emerged Benjamin's famous reading of the image, which turned it into an icon, or the 20th century's definitive thought image, as Joseph Corner calls it. Five decades later, art historian O.K. Werkmeister challenged those for whom Benjamin's ninth thesis had become a kind of pocket-sized soothing stone, holding out an elusive formula for making sense of the senseless, for reversing the irreversible while being subject to a kind of political brooding, all the more protracted, the less promising the prospects for political practice appear to be. Werkmeister suggests that the image short circuits any possibility of action by aligning revolutionary rhetoric with mere culture. For this perpetual holding pattern, he writes, Benjamin's own notion of a dialectics at a standstill offers its own tailor-made philosophical validation. These contradictions notwithstanding, Benjamin's image and the reading, his reading of the image, maintains a deep resonance that I want to think with and in some ways to think against for a few more minutes. To work within the context of Benjamin's Judaism, we can say that what his angel is seeing is a broken world, a world that might be made whole, though we don't know if this is ever a possibility or just an unfulfillable promise. The task of making it whole in any case requires a leap of faith. The world is broken today, not only in that the compact or contract or covenant among humans is broken with suffering compounded in so many ways, but also that the covenant or contract between humans and the rest of the world is equally broken. These two forms of brokenness concern many in one form or another. We sense it today. Benjamin was writing about the philosophy of history and making the case 
for a history that didn't merely document the past as it was, a ready-made history that represented some irresistible progress leading to an inevitable future, either a perfectibility of mankind, a Hegelian realization of universal spirit, a deterministic Marxism that sees class revolution as inevitable, or alternatively, some cataclysmic future that could also not be prevented. It was rather to see history as open and for its openings, and to see the present as the time of the now that is shot through with chips of messianic time, in which every second of time can be the straight gate through which the Messiah, which for him also means revolution, might enter. For Benjamin, the historian's task was not to document the past nor predict the future, but to save or redeem the past in accordance with the Kabbalistic concept of tikkun olam, meaning to gather the sparks, in Benjamin's words, to remember and awaken the dead and to make whole what has been smashed. Benjamin's reading was his own, a desperate wartime reading of an otherwise unknown artwork from a previous wartime two decades earlier. In this reading, the storm, capital P, progress, is blowing the angel toward the future, but his gaze is turned to the past. His or her gaze uh, is turned to the past and toward us. We see not the future, but the gaze of the angel seeing us. This is, of course, Benjamin's seeing, since it's he who's uh, seeing with and through the gaze of the angel. He's not actually describing the image itself, as if Benjamin's eyes were the angel's eyes. The image we see when we look at Clay's angel is a humanoid figure, possibly flying, possibly angelic, though at the very least bird-like, even a little chicken-like, a hybrid of man and bird. Birds are dwellers between earth and sky, earth and heaven, which depending on our assumptions about heaven can mean different things. In Chinese philosophy, heaven is what provides the mandate for earthly affairs and for their rulership, their sovereignty. Heaven is the place of overview, the view that sees the whole, or at least looks down upon the human and earthly realm and takes its measure. The upraised arms or wings could be a warning or even an attempt to stop something, a kind of heavenly stop sign, which may be supported by the gaze that seems concerned, though it's not entirely clear. He or she, the angel, seems to be looking to their left as if something is coming around the side from our right, which, politically speaking, may be oddly appropriate. But the arms could also be a giving, a benediction, a blessing, or a revealing, these are my hands, these hands are empty, they carry no weapon, they offer no bread. They only keep me aloft and give me some distance from what I'm witnessing. It's this distance I want us to consider, as we ourselves are not sure how distant we are or should be from those experiencing bombings or thirst and desperate hunger in Gaza, terror attacks in Israel, daily bombardment in Ukraine, criminal violence in Mexico, and so on and so forth. Angels are among a series of figures, including gods and other divinities, that afford the possibility of distance, they stand in between us and others, mediating, sheltering, sometimes absolving of responsibility, sometimes solidifying the judgment of the social collective. With Benjamin's angel, what we get is a kind of shared horror, the solidarity of one who stands beside us, but not amongst us, who sees and feels, sees with his or her heart-mind, but is not involved in what is seen, and yet one, what who sees, one who sees all of it over and over as it builds continually in the place where we stand. I want to suggest that this idea of the angelic, the semi-bird, semi-human observer who hovers over us, who isn't involved but seems compelled to signal something, indicating concern and care, 
is a perspective shared across many cultures as the perspective of an other who is not entirely other, who is there as a guide or helper, a messenger, a reference point at least, who reflects us back to us while offering an expanded context for understanding ourselves and our world. This figure sees more than we, in our workaday involvements, normally see. The angel sees us in the midst of our world, alerting us to the wreckage building around us, but also the wreckage we can in some measure prevent. It's this kind of seeing that the angel makes available to us, since it is, after all, we, or in this case, Benjamin, who see the angel seeing the wreckage. There's no wreckage in what clay depicts. It's only in what Benjamin sees through the eyes of Clay's angel. Of the nearly 80 paintings of angels produced by the Swiss-born Clay, most of them in his last few years of life, this early one remains the one that most directly faces us, the viewers. It's a kind of portrait that captures the gaze of the one who looks not only at us, but into us, as the best portraits tend to do. There is in this direct gaze a kind of looking in that forces us to perhaps avert our gaze as it may discomfort us. What do we look like, we might wonder, through the eyes of the angel of history? We humans who, in the era of the human, the Anthropocene, may wish to assume that we are the only ones who should be doing the looking. Of course, we know that today we aren't really the sole lookers. Sorry. Uh, there are eyes all around us, capturing our movements, taking our measure, subjecting it to algorithmic modulations as the symbolic order, the order of language within which we become subjects, becomes an algorithmic order, the, the one that sees us back and shapes us in its seeing, but which we can never quite see or shape. Some are more looked at, scanned, fingerprinted, databased, and monitored than others. There is a huge challenge in remaking this algorithmic order of media governmentalities into a habitable, democratically responsive order, a publicly accountable and transparent one, which is a huge topic that I could happily talk about some other time. But today I want to get at a different kind of order, the imaginal order by which we account for ourselves in the face of the shared collective humanity to which we can only aspire. There are many eyes of those who see us back because they beckon us to see ourselves through their eyes. They remind us that we humans today are torn between those who look and those who do not normally have that luxury. These are, you may recognize, the works of French photographer and street artist J.R., whose work gives not so much voice as eyes to people around the world who are normally not thought of as seeing us, us who are the viewers of art, the travelers of the world, the global traveling class. The eye of the camera can be another eye that looks back at us, um, as in Ukrainian documentarist Serhii Loznitsa's film Austerlitz, which depicts visitors to the Sachsenhausen and Dachau concentration camps, Holocaust tourists in effect. Loznitsa sets up his camera in front of the crowds to give us several minute long blocks of time watching the visitors arrive and move through the camps with tour guides, listening devices, or without. Loznitsa's ethical challenge here is how to show us the death camps today, three quarters of a century after they were used for the machinery of mass slaughter. How to lead us into it without providing the decades of narrative that have become customary to it, but which have lost their potency. His answer is by not showing us that machinery at all, but instead by showing us, today's viewers and visitors, and letting us be led into it without seeing what it is that we see. We are, of course, not 
we, for as long as we maintain the distance afforded by the viewer's irony, the distance of mind without heart. We viewers on this side of the screen, they, the tourists, the others, whoever they may be on the other side. But that distance, which is what gives us the sense that we are superior to them, cannot be maintained indefinitely, and this is our viewerly challenge. If it, the world, the dead, the death camp victims, the angel of history, time itself could look back at us, this is something like what it might see today. Faces of curious, t-shirted, camera-toting onlookers, selfie takers, the materiality of a tourist mass making its way across the viewscape of death, looking, snapping photos, eating, moving, chatting, advertising a bodyscape of t-shirt logos, brands, and slogans that identify us as incorporated into the symbolic order of our society, are not the death camp victims and the death camps themselves the ancestral deities to whom the visitors pay their respects, haltingly, haphazardly, not quite knowing how. Can they, can we learn to do that better? The film in its open-endedness suggests that perhaps we can. Now there's a problem in, I think, in the film in that the camera is not pure camera. It's held, shaped, edited by someone whose invisibility is assumed. But that's also a topic for another day. What I'm trying to suggest is that there's a need for us to develop the eyes, the gaze, the subject positions of the angel of history, of the dead, of ancestors and also descendants in and through which we can see ourselves. What do they see when they look at us? The dead see the living, we who are indebted to them. The not yet born see those who shape their conditions for living. The others, the angels, the deities who see from a space that is otherwise in relation to ours, see our loss and our struggle to refashion it into habitable forms. Part two. I take the phrase, of course, from Gramsci, for whom pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, describes, in Francesca Antonini's words, the coexistence of a realistic description of the status quo on one hand, and a genuine commitment to the possibility of transforming reality on the other. In a book-length exegesis of Benjamin's theses, aptly titled Fire Alarm, Michael Luvi refers to Benjamin's revolutionary pessimism, which is opposed both to melancholy fatalism, which today would be the resigned acceptance of eco-disaster or some disaster, and to optimistic fatalism, which assumes that humans will inevitably rise to the occasion and overcome the prospect of disaster. Revolutionary pessimism recognizes the acuteness of the moment of danger and the absolute possibility, perhaps probability of disaster. It is tragic in its pessimism, yet it rises to revolutionary action knowing that this is the only way the past could be redeemed and that the effort to do it is the only worthy remembrance of its victims. There is no guarantee of success but nor is there any guarantee in the triumph of the present. As Luvi puts it, ben, in Benjamin's open conception of history, not only does each present open onto a multiplicity of possible futures, it also opens onto a multiplicity of pasts, whereby the judgments of history become malleable in the face of our actions today. In his preparatory notes to the theses, Benjamin suggests that Marx may be wrong about revolutions being the locomotive of world history. Perhaps it is otherwise, he says, that revolutions are an attempt by the passengers on this train, namely the human race, to activate the emergency brake. Revolution, as Luvi puts it, is for Benjamin the interruption of a catastrophe-bound journey. 
These two metaphors are powerful in their divergence. As the locomotive of world history, revolutions would be leading us onward toward our destination. Without them, we slow down or get derailed. They may be necessary, but their itineraries are already sealed. The only question is when they'll arrive and whether or not they'll get us there on time. Considering the revolutions of the past, the French, the American, the Russian, the Chinese, the Iranian, the Velvet, and so on, it might seem that revolutions hardly agree on their destination, which suggests that the locomotive of world history runs in fits and starts along a confusing set of divergent itineraries. Considered interruptions on our journey, however, revolutions are necessary because the journey has always already been hijacked. This is Benjamin's point about progress, which is a storm bringing catastrophe after catastrophe, a locomotive running headlong into an abyss. And here's where we can make our segue to the present, the climate crisis, and the recent not quite over pandemic. Soon after the COVID-19 pandemic began, Bruno Latour noted the incredible discovery that already in the world economic system there was, hidden from us all, a bright red alarm button with a nice big stainless steel handle that the heads of state could pull one after the other to instantly stop the train of progress with all the brakes squealing. The difference, of course, is that it was not the people of the world, but heads of state who pulled the emergency brake, and we've seen how, since then, they've eagerly gotten the train running again. Emergency brakes are interesting things. They're powerful, and everything with them depends on who has the power to pull them and for what reason. When heads of state pulled them, the natural response for many was to examine their reasons. Some found them acceptable and went along, Others did not, or more often simply didn't trust them and resisted, resisted masking, resisted vaccinating, and so on. The fact that they mostly could be trusted doesn't alter this dynamic. Some will refuse, as they might refuse to accept the belt tightening called for by economists in times of recession, or as they might refuse to accept scientists' climate change narrative and the energy transition called for by environmentalists, and so on. In part, it's a refusal to accept an emergency defined by those you don't trust. The same people are willing to accept emergencies defined by their own prophets and doomsayers. If the agreement were on whether we are in an emergency, there'd be less question about it. It's about whose emergency and what it demands of us. For that reason, it might be better not to call upon our leaders to declare the emergency, the COVID emergency, the climate emergency, the migrants at the border emergency, the war economy, and so on. Emergency suggests panic, suspension of normality, and a general state of exception. If instead we see ourselves as in a situation of urgency, we can move from panic to focus, from state of exception to deliberation over what's necessary and what isn't. In a state of urgency, what can we afford to do less of? And how do we best attend to the most vulnerable? The doing less shouldn't be so difficult to determine. Everyone who's happy to work from home has learned that it isn't necessary to go to work, that work could be done otherwise. Everyone whose job was suspended with no great detriment to the world learned that the job might not actually be necessary. What's necessary is the income it brings to the job holder. I think of the great resignation of workers that unfolded during the pandemic and that according to some figures has not quite a ended. I think of the bullshit jobs David Graeber wrote about in his 2013 viral article and 2018 best-selling book. Graeber was clear that he wasn't in a position to tell people their jobs were meaningless, but that nevertheless there are many people who are convinced of that already, up to 40 percent according to surveys he cited but at least 20% according to other surveys, who only work at those jobs because they have to work, not because they believe that work to be needed for anyone. If they stopped doing it tomorrow, it's mainly the salaries that would be missed. 
So it's, we're talking about an exchange of money with more of the money typically going to those who already have it. If you think I'm working my way toward proposing some sort of general strike, you'd be a little ahead of me since there, there's little horizon for that to occur, primarily because the salaries are so significant to all of us. But what I'm proposing is prioritization in every way possible, from personal choices to divestment of funds to mass mobilization when the opportunity arises. As for vulnerability, here's where the climate change narrative is pretty capacious in its ability to capture the leveling effects of disasters to come. Vulnerability is a condition most people understand. When people are at risk of losing their homes from wildfires, hurricanes, annual storms of the century, sea level rise, drought, etc., what we realize is that we share a precarity from which border walls are not likely to protect us. At its heart, this precarity is the vulnerability to events, whether hurricanes, wildfires, floods, or wars, that brings us closer to those for whom such events have been continuous. Military takeovers, colonization and dispossession, forced deportation and resettlement, and so on. These are events or histories that uproot us, processes by which we lose our bearings in the world, lose our ground, our oikos or habitat, which is the root of the word ecology. They are events of eco-trauma. Some have lived through this kind of trauma for centuries. Eco-trauma is both a generic category of experience and something embedded within the conditions of the colonial capitalist Anthropocene. I tend to think of it as a series of interdependent zones, each enfolding the other, a pre-traumatic zone for those who've managed to shelter themselves so far, a becoming traumatic zone for those who face loss of shelter and bearings in a readily imaginable, almost here future, an already traumatized zone for refugees seeking shelter from wildfires, droughts, rising seas, and wars, and a continuously traumatized, continuously post-traumatic zone where we find indigenous and colonized populations for whom climate change is continuous with what they have already experienced. If all of us are poised somehow in some relationship to this kind of precarity, to the loss of groundedness, to eco-trauma, to a broken world, then we have a common language from which to start and the metaphor that suggests itself is world repair. So with this in mind, that there will be conflicts and struggles that will need to be fought, I wanna bring us back to this child contemplating a broken world. It's a sculpture by Jason DeCare Taylor, whose works displayed at the bottom of the ocean suggest a humanity beneath the waves of a changing climate, a humanity sleepwalking toward disaster, beset by uncertainty and resignation, caught on life rafts and sunk beneath the waves, but also a humanity willing to give itself to become the coral basis for new ocean life. His underwater sculptures composed of pH neutral materials are aesthetically pleasing objects that double as artificial reefs, intended to sustain and proliferate the life of the organisms that are losing their habitus as human, humans reduce coral reefs around the planet. They are an instance of human art collaborating with non-human art, art in the sense of practical skill, whether that be the skill of creative reappropriation of objects or the skill that it takes to root in and grow on such objects. They are media in which things grow, experimental forms of mutual accommodation and creative collaboration between human and non-human actors, biological and geological processes. This work called Anthropocene, off the coast of Mexico, depicts the decomposing carcass of industrial civilization in one of its most personal forms, the Volkswagen Beetle along whose windshield a child rests as if gripping the vehicle turned reef for life-giving comfort. 
It's the spirit of squeezing a multi-species afterlife from the decomposing body of the industrial capitalocentric Anthropocene that is required for us to contemplate what we need to get through the state of emergency or state of urgency that is ahead. This work called Vicissitudes is located off the coast of Grenada, an island of which the vast majority of human inhabitants are descended from slaves stolen from West Africa and brought across the Atlantic. Some of them died on the way, some were thrown off the slave ships and buried beneath the ocean, some survived. David Carazza writes that by creating a work of art, which literally becomes part of a living thing, the coral reef, Taylor taps into a rich thematic vein for thinking about the slave trade. He takes figures that in one sense represent death and turns them into the medium for new life with the process that enacts violence on their bodies, producing an afterlife in vibrant color. The irony is that Taylor, a white British artist, did not intend this meaning, but it took it on in its own afterlife as it interacted with cultures of interpretation and layers of time, historical and geological layers resonant with the middle passage of slaves from Africa to the Americas. I wanna suggest that it is another middle passage, a reverse passage, out of colonial slavery toward a different future that global culture may need to undertake. In the midst of the COVID pandemic and the George Floyd protests, Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe wrote of the universal right to breathe. COVID, he wrote, has exposed the extent to which we humans are not the only inhabitants of the earth, nor are we set above others. We are crossed by fundamental interactions with microbes and viruses and all sorts of vegetal, mineral, and organic forces. More accurately, we are partly composed of these other beings, but they also decompose and recompose us. They make and unmake us, starting with our bodies, our environments, and our ways of living and dying. If indeed COVID-19 is the spectacular expression of the planetary impasse in which humanity finds itself today, then it's a matter of no, no, no less than reconstructing a habitable earth to give all of us the breath of life. Humankind and biosphere are one. Are we capable of rediscovering that each of us belongs to the same species, that we have an indivisible bond with all life? Just as Benjamin, in our open-hearted realist reading, had suggested that the revolutionary historian's task is to open both the future and the past, Mbembe cites Franz Fanon to suggest that where colonization negated the time of the colonized, liberation from colonialism creates time. From the colonial point of view, natives were not simply people without a past and without history. They were people radically located outside of time. Europe had the monopoly on that essential human quality we call the disposition toward the future. To the colonial framework of predetermination, decolonization opposes the framework of possibility, the possibility of a different type of being, a different type of time, a different type of creation, different forms of life, a different humanity, the possibility of reconstituting the human after humanism's complicity with colonial racism. Mbembe writes, if we must together walk anew the paths of humanity in companionship with all species, then it's perhaps necessary to begin by recognizing that at bottom, there is no world or place where we are totally at home, masters of the premises. What is proper always arises at the same time as what is foreign. Mbembe is suggesting that we have never been completely at home. If Bruno Latour had argued once that we have never been modern, the corollary is also true. We have never been pre-modern, fully emplaced and thoroughly tradition bound. We have always negotiated and renegotiated our relations and this will not change. What will change is the demand to do so more coherently. In this sense, Fanon's comment applies not only to colonized peoples, but to a colonized earth. 
to a colonialism applied at the scale of the earth to life itself, an earth conceived as without time on which humanity imposes its time, its space, its agency. It turns out that earth does have its own time many times, some of them extending far beyond the human in both directions to the deep past and to the unknowable future. In some of these earthly times, humans constitute a mere episode. Decolonization in this sense requires finding new and different forms of life in which the earth itself, a living earth with its own time and its own possibilities, intermingle with a humanity rendered open to multiple futurities and multiple ancestralities, all of them mixed with many non-humans in changing relationships, contracts, alliances, and formations. The task ahead is to find ourselves among the multitudes of a world that is not our own, and certainly not ours to own, but that calls upon us to join it, to recognize it, to discover, discover its difference from us. A world, or perhaps a zone, an ecotone, a meeting ground of what is ours and what is not ours, a territory full of its own kind of life that opens out to foreignness, a foreignness we can never fully see, understand, encompass, or even imagine. To create the future is to create a time that is no longer ours, that has never been ours, but to which we might nevertheless contribute if we give ourselves to it. And we might then start by recognizing the discomfort and anxiety this brings us, returning to a dynamic earth that uproots homes and washes away borders is frightening. To survive in this zone, we can't proceed unchanged, hiding behind gates and walls of economic, ethno-national, religious, or other identity barriers. We can only move forward knowing we must remake and refine ourselves collectively in experiments of multi-human and multi-species futurity that are hardly imaginable from where we are today. Or else we can, as Pedro Marzorati suggests in this sculpture, continue marching blindly forward in our somnolent colonial arrogance or go, and go down with the tide. That's the choice before us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful panorama of a talk. There's so many ways to go into this, and also welcome to uh, SFU. I'll maybe start with one question before we open it up for um, uh, discussion. In the way um, that you talked about uh, Mabembe, this notion of the planetary or the earthly, um, there's many thinkers from Chakraborty to uh, Latour who took, talk about it in the late 90s, early 2000s, globalization and particular forms of critique were around. I'm wondering how you um, think through that difference between what was discussions around globalization versus the earthly or the planetary. Well, that's a pretty broad and open-ended question. Uh, how do I think through the... Uh, you mean the difference between the global and the earthly? Uh, I mean, I think the, that globalization sort of was the, the ruling um, keyword of the 90s for, for good reason, because um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we sort of had this more open global order constituting itself um, as it did in, in ways that to some people seemed liberating or seemed, uh, seemed, seemed to be bringing the world together, but obviously um, that may have been a little short-sighted at the time. Um, but what was not part of that conversation was the kind of political ecology on which it all rested, and that's become part of um, I think, fortunately, in, in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, that's definitely become more and more of the uh, critical discourse, is this recognition that um, we are 
whatever um, social and political um, differences we, we debate and engage in, uh, all of them depend on ecological um, foundations in a sense. But I think, um, so, so I think the earthly is, is um, um, you know, it's, it's become part of the conversation. But how do we think of it is the challenge, and I think it's um, partly thanks to indigenous people and indigenous theorists uh, that it's becoming more recognized that in fact humans are always and have always been earthly, have always been um, live, living in um, intimate relationship with places, with, with um, you know, ecologies, with trees, with plants, and so on. And while this is most visible in um, smaller scale indigenous societies where we can talk about traditional ecological knowledge and so on, the fact that it's become invisible is something for all of us to think about. Uh, it's a kind of missing, uh, uh, um, you know, several layers of, of understanding ourselves have been missing. So I think it, it's important to get beyond the merely earthly to talk about, I mean, Latour in his late years talked about the terrestrial and becoming terrestrial and the earthbound, and uh, he, he was trying to get at how, how we can talk about specific um, socio-ecological relationships. I'm not sure that he succeeded at getting that onto the agenda or, or at really theorizing it, but I think it's an important uh, site of conversation and and theory. Thank you. Yeah. The mic is open right here, um, so please do join us. I don't mind if people just stay quiet and take a few minutes. Hmm. And... <laughs> I don't think I have a question, but only uh, an expression of appreciation of how, at least for me, it, how part of how I experienced what you had to say is a, um, a bringing together of the need for like a, an intellectual advancement of the human collective with uh, kind of a mutation of what is the human. Um, how are we to exist in a way beyond just understanding, but to experience ourselves in an entirely different way which is inextricably related to, you know, an intellectual mutation. But I feel like you, um, you've touched on that more experiential aspect of the human. Um, that, well, you did it in a way that is very difficult. And I, I think uh, you, you, didn't, you did it in a way that, that moved me. Thank you. Thank you. I promised I wouldn't ask, ask the first question. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. I want to uh, push at something, if I can. Yeah. Uh, when you're t how are you talking about emotions and affect and generosity? Uh, last week, when Christina Sharp was in town. I think she was quoting Natalie Diaz, saying how it's actually impossible to be empathic all the time. Like if, we're, if we have empathy all the time, we couldn't do anything because mm. you know, there's so much suffering in the world. But also... And I think the same way in terms of generosity, but also, and this is why the kind of, you know, the Lacanians don't trust affect because they seem to be about me. I'm the generous person. I'm the empathic person. Aren't I empathic towards you? They seem to be different from solidarity. So I wonder if you want to talk about how you, if you see them as different or how they work between people in radically different conditions. And also, is it, simply about the most vulnerable. If that seems to be something the left likes to talk about because then we're good leftists because we care about the poorest of the poor, um, the most desperate. And we don't have to care about people who have agency and who are doing things. Yeah. Thanks, Clint. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to draw lines between the most vulnerable and everyone else. I think 
it's more about um, being able to see vulnerability and see it as a kind of shared horizon, something that we can actually um, move into, even with people uh, with whom we don't share intellectual uh, common grounds or political common grounds, um, because vulnerability is sort of, you know, this, this I, I do see this planetary precarity, or, or precarity is a kind of planetary condition for, for, for all of us. Um, um, so it's not, it's not about, you know, deciding who's the most vulnerable, although sometimes that can help us prior, prioritize what we should do. Um, your first question uh, about empathy. Yeah, what, what's the name of that condition where people are hyper-empathic and they just can't help but overfeel and and it drives them crazy if sorry hysteria, hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well of course we, we we can't always yeah i mean there's i don't know if there's anything we can always do uh and there are people who put themselves in situations of of you know the um, human rights workers in Gaza right now, and people who are just on the ground helping, and that's their whole life's work, and that that that's really laudable. But most people aren't capable of doing that because it's it's not where we are. Uh, so so yeah, I wouldn't advocate you know empathy as the absolute solution in all situations, but I would want. Uh, our thinking about the world to be infused with our feeling what what we feel from the world that we encounter uh, so so somehow I do want to um, kind of you know emphasize the importance of that uh, dimension of who we are or who we can be Hello, Hi. Adrian. Thank you so much. This was um, a fascinating talk, and I was simply mesmerized in the first part. I got sober in the second. <laughs> um, I, and I do want to tie partially the Benjamin to Mimembe, uh, mm. and I do want to do this partially through loss and reconstitution, uh, because one of the things that actually in the Werkmeister's text, uh, which is a fantastic text, thank you so much for like bringing it into conversation, mm. is that um, the angel of history actually went through a couple of stages, and at the very end, uh, the wings were broken down and there was nothing that, like there was no possibility of any kind of reconstitution or any kind of dressing of the, up on, of the wounds. And I think that that was precisely why Benjamin found himself in the situation that he did and he committed suicide mm. in the end because he thought that the loss was something that can be repaired. Uh, and right now we're talking about the trauma and the loss that came with it. Isn't it the case that maybe if we're thinking too much of the repair or any kind of reconstitution, that we will find ourselves in a kind of um, inevitability or a fatalism that you're talking about? Instead of that, maybe um, some kind of a way or some kind of a new affect which is not personal, mm. uh, which is not individualistic or egoistic, but a shared affect, uh, a shared affect of, as you were saying, like maybe precarity, maybe something else, would allow us to dwell in that space of loss, which also for psychoanalysis is, is foundational. Uh, it, is, uh, it is what we are, and all of our lives we're trying to build over that loss. What if the loss remains open, the wounds remain open, mm. and, uh, and we do something with it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think you've actually put, put your finger on something that's a, a bit of a sort of potential internal con contradiction in what I gave, um, which is that, yes, Benjamin was, was talking about repairing something 
that has been broken, or at least that's, that's a certain theme that I was talking about, which suggests looking to the past for the wholeness. And that's ultimately not where I want to take this. Uh, so, so, so I think the, the metaphor that I would want to work with is not repairing a broken world in order to put, it, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but rather repairing it into something new. So fashioning from that world something that can take on its own life that is not ours to decide. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so I, I think I agree with you that there is something contradictory. Uh, about Benjamin himself, yeah, I kind of considered what, what to do about the fact that he, this was his last complete kind of piece that he wrote, uh, and he committed suicide not long after that. But he did it for very, you know, within a very specific set of conditions, and I hesitate to want to over-interpret this piece as, as deeply kind of connected to his fate. Um, but maybe it could be. It certainly could be. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, and th thank you for the beautiful paper. Um, I did want to ask a question that arises out of your answer to Am's question and then something that Clint um, obliquely deflected off of, in a sense. Mm. Um, in a 1983 um, edited journal, or an edition edited by Russell Means, an indigenous activist and scholar, he, um, he asks, or his critique of of Marxism in relationship to indigenous folks is that the European materialist tradition of de-spiritualizing the universe is something that he doesn't want to have as a groundwork. Um, more recently on an um, on a indigenous activist website, there's a slogan from some young, younger folks who say, we celebrate the death of leftist solidarity and its myopic apocalyptic romanticism. I'm just wondering, within the way that you've been setting up these these frameworks and these conversations, if if that's uh, if if you can find a way to make to locate Benjamin and what you're moving towards within those. Thanks. Uh, so was that a quote by uh, Russell Means? That last yeah. one? No, uh, the last one was on a website. Oh. So of a collective um, a collective piece of writing, but the first one's yeah, Russell Means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Benjamin really stands out among Marxists as someone who had, was, was juggling this kind of messianic um, Judaism and very spiritual kind of thing that he was trying to, he was trying to somehow theologize um, Marxism or vice versa, Marxize his theology or something. And... Uh, and, and, you know, people can easily critique that. Um, I think I, from what I remember of Russell Means and that kind of thing in the 80s, I, I, I resonate with that critique of a kind of uh, materialism that sees the world as dead uh, and humans as, as the agents in it. Um, so, so I mean, I, I tend to go along with what's known as the ontological turn, where, where we sort of understand that the world has a liveliness and that different um, groups of people have, have, have fashioned that liveliness into different ways of thinking about it. And, and uh, for some of them, there are these, I mean, I'm talking about angels here. What's the reality of, of angels? Um, you know, they're not... Uh, ontologically the same kind of thing as we humans are, but they play a role in the way we meet, uh, we navigate the world and, and mediate our own relations with each other and with the rest of the world. Um, so so um, I'm kind of on board with looking at how uh, spiritual or non um, non-material 
terminology gets used to, uh, to, to have real effects in the world, uh, a world that is not just humans. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that quite gets at what you were asking about. Um, hmm. I've got about five more minutes or so. I'll ask another uh, question. You, mm -hmm. you um, got to Shilma Bembe's work towards the um, end of your talk and wondering uh, if maybe something that maybe didn't bring it, uh, didn't have time to bring into the talk, but for you, what is it that he brings um, into ecological or planetary questions that's important for you? Well, I'm, I think the, the most important thing within the, the field that I tend to get identified with, which is the, the environmental humanities um, in the last number of years, has been the kind of decolonial uh, impulse, the, the realization that uh, people who talk about environmental issues, about the ecological crisis, the climate crisis, and so on, can no longer ignore um, 500 years of colonial history and and all of the, um, um, the you know the multiple ways in which um, not just capitalist economic relations, but but um, you know, coloniality and liberation movements and the relationship with land that people have had that has all gotten, uh, you know, dramatically altered in the last five centuries, how that is central to, to understanding the ecological crisis and what we can do about it and how, um, therefore, we need to look outside of European colonial thinking. Uh, and, and I find Mbembe such a um, you know, powerful voice in that um, with his recent uh, writing and, and recent speaking uh, in particular. Yeah. Great, thank you. We've got time for one more question if there are any. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. A um, little bit, you know, the, I want to give you some question about the uh, Walter Benjamin text on the concept of history. You actually uh, um, the discussed uh, the angel is the Angelus Nobus, um, but actually uh, in the text, the, another quite important concept is a tiger's leap, is a splinter tiger, tiger's leap toward the future. So, I think that uh, concept is uh, open to the many interpretation. Um, would give us, you know, some kind of uh, idea. The history is not progressive. Mm -hmm. It's not like a development. Mm -hmm. it's something leap, you know, the, the concentration or some kind of intensive, you know, mm -hmm. the the obsession or some excess, something like that. It's uh, because of the including war and then those days uh, or some movement know, uh, anything, you know, related to the one. So uh, um, from the kind of perspective, you know, the, how can you actually locate your ecological or some environmental, you know, the idea, you know, which can give us some alternative, uh, you know, the, 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 the future to what we experience at the moment. So could you elaborate that idea further? Mm. You. Could you say again the the term that you used? Tiger's from the, leap. Tiger's leap. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there's another kind of um, maybe contradiction in Benjamin's theses between the image of of that the angel sees of history sort of piling wreckage upon wreckage, which makes it sound like this um, absolutely downward. Uh, you know, headlong rush to apocalypse. And on the other hand, the idea that uh, the, the messianic can come in at any moment, and it's all about how we in our moment can reconfigure the past and reconfigure the future. And that's, that second idea is one that I 
find more useful and more resonant. And I find it in other in Deleuze and 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 others. Um, but as far as the of, of ecology goes, I I find the notion of multiple times very useful because, in fact, uh, you know there are historical narratives that every society comes up with that have their own kind of curve, whatever it may be, sometimes upward and then downward and sometimes more circular and spiraling. But uh, there's also time that goes on that preceded humanity and it's, you know, we can barely make sense of it. Things happening for eons and then sudden shifts and changes and they will outlive us too. So geological time offers us a very different, and I don't just mean the time that geologists can measure, but I mean deep time offers us a whole different lens on how to think historically about where we are today. And if we bring several different times into conversation with each other, uh, including this angel perceiving crisis upon crisis, but also including uh, us, you know, others that see possibility and that see, uh, and that see beyond the human kind of very short uh, episode on Earth. What does that mean? I don't know. And that's good. I don't want to know everything. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sam.